Bill Sheft, writer, Aquarius. Well, actually, the first time, you know, I was always uh, funny, and my family is funny. I'm the fifth of six children. I'm from a large Jewish family. There was, there was never enough guilt to go around. And um, I, when I was 18, uh, I was at Deerfield Academy, and uh, me and a few of my friends, we might have stolen a faculty member's car, and we drove into Northampton, and I did uh, seven minutes of stand-up, mostly stolen material, at a bar called The Early Times. And from the ages of 18 to 22, I think I probably performed twice a year. I won my undergraduate talent show at, um, at Harvard doing stand-up. And it was always something I knew I could do. It was always like a hobby with me. But I always had the feeling that if the nut came to crunch, uh, I could make a little money at it. But I, I, majored, uh, I majored in Latin at uh, Harvard because I thought the church was going to come back. And... Um, you know, it's one of those things where I majored in Latin and Greek because I loved, that was the only thing I really was interested in academically. It really, I think it, it's the best preparation for a writer because it teaches you the value of a word and of the word. And um, so I went to Harvard fully intending to be either, you know, a Latin teacher or a pharmacist. You know, I mean, really, really what can you do with a classics degree? And... Um, uh, I ended up, I, I think I got a C- in, um, in a graduate course my freshman year in Herodotus, and then I turned my sights to becoming a sports writer, and uh, I did that for a while, and then I became, I was a stand-up comic for 13 years, and then in 1991, I was hired uh, by then Late Night with David Letterman at NBC, and, and here we are. When you're 16, 17, 18, and you're staying up and you're watching The Tonight Show, and this is, this is the mid, the early and mid-70s, you know, it's, it's George Carlin and Richard Pryor, and, and I was introduced to Lenny Bruce when I was uh, 18. It's a huge influence on not my stand-up, but me wanting to become a stand-up. And I was just one of those guys that I would watch the stand-ups, and boy, that must be great to do that, but, you know, you never think that that's what you're going to do, and, and I ended up doing it for, for, for 13 years, and uh, I heard, I don't know whose this line is, but it's a great line, is that people become stand-up comics uh, the same way uh, a woman becomes a hooker. I mean, you start uh, uh, doing it um, for uh, a couple of friends, and then you realize you're good enough to get paid. <laughs> when I was a comedian, and I was a comic for 13 years, my act was uh, Jews, Sports, and Weather. That was my act. To talk about being Jewish, I did a lot of sports material because I was a sports writer, and, uh, and I also had a gig uh, later on. I, was, I had my own humor column in Sports Illustrated for three years called The Show, which I loved, which was the perfect marriage of all my careers. It was just topical jokes about sports every week. And, um, and, and, and I was, uh, I'm going to steal Dave Letterman's line about his stand-up career. I was good. I was a good stand-up. But I was never going to be the guy that you pay $20 to see. I was just not going to, uh, because, because unlike my wife, who still performs, my my heart wasn't in it. I didn't have to be up there. I was good enough to be up there. I made a living at it. But boy, I'll tell you, you know, 12 years in and you wake up in, in a Motel 6 in Covington, Kentucky, and you say to yourself, I, I'm, I'm not in show business. I'm just Willie Loman with a bag of jokes. I'm just going from town to town trying to, you know, trying to get the people in a, in a different town. And that's, that's all it was. But I was, you know, I was one of those guys that was out there. And I did every television show except the ones that could help your career. It was so funny because they knew me at the Letterman show not as a writer because I used to audition to try and get on the show as a comic. And I had a line in my act, uh, which has been, uh, I'm proud to say, has been stolen by several comics. I had a line in my act. I said... Uh, for those of you here in New York, uh, it's great. The Dyslexic Theater Company is in town, 
and they're doing Annie Get Your Nug. And um, Bob Morton, the producer of Letterman, said, if you have six more minutes as good as that one line, he said, I will put you on next week. And uh, sadly, I didn't. I had some good lines. I had some good lines. I've forgotten them all. I, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I wrote for Chris Rock on the Academy Awards, and he hired a lot of comics to write. And it was a lot of people I hadn't seen in a long time because I stopped performing. And Carol Liefer was one of the writers. And Carol Liefer, and we went out the first night, we went out for Chinese food. And Carol Liefer said, you know, every time I have Chinese food, I think about your bit about Chinese food. And I said to her, I'd love to hear it because I have no recollection of this. And the bit was, I used to do a bit about... Um, you know, when you go out for Chinese food, they take down your order in Chinese, the waiter. How are you supposed to dispute this bill at the end of the meal? Excuse me, waiter! I didn't order the television antenna. <laughs> and that's the kind of cutting edge stuff that came out of me. First of all, thank you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm glad that the question is phrased so that uh, it's assumed that I write funny stuff every day. <laughs> I appreciate that. You know, I think if you do it, and if you, if you write for a strip show, which is what Letterman is, which is a show that's on five days a week, um, you don't think about it in terms of, if, you ever th if I ever thought about what I had to do at the beginning of every day, I don't think I could do it. It's just with, with comedy writing, especially writing on a daily basis, it's a muscle that you work and it's, it's, you know, and if you keep working it, you can do it. And Woody Allen once said about joke writing, if you can do it, there's nothing to it. And, and, and I believe that. And I'm mostly, uh, with the Letterman show, I've been a monologue writer, so the, I just write jokes for the most part. I work on other stuff on the show. And it's just, when I first started at the show in 1991, and they told me I had to write 15 jokes a day, I thought, how am I going to do this? And uh, then I just tried to get through that day. And then within about six months, I, was, I wasn't writing 15 jokes a day. I was writing 25 or 30. And it got to the point where I was writing like 50 or 60 jokes a day. And, you know, they're not all great. And actually very few of them are great. But that's the thing about comedy is that you have to you have to write a lot to get, you have to make mounds and mounds of coleslaw to get one good serving. And that's what we do on The Letterman Show. We just create a lot of content and ideally uh, the best content gets on the show. Here's the thing about The Late Show with David Letterman, the writers, and Dave Letterman. We write a lot of stuff that's funny. We write a lot of stuff it's pretty good. We write a lot of stuff that's lame. But invariably, invariably, night after night, the funniest moments in the show are Dave reacting in real time to his surroundings. And it's something that you cannot write in preparation for the show. When Dave comes out at the beginning of the night, the writer's job is to put him in, in a situation where if he needs it, it's there. You know, the monologue is there if he needs it. The top ten is there if he needs it. A couple of good tape pieces are there if he needs it. And then he can just relax and just react in the moment. And, uh, you know, I have a friend, Kelly Rogers, who I started with, who was a great comic that people don't know about. And Kelly Rogers said something that was so profound. He said, your act is for the nights when you're not funny. And, and that's, that's, the, that's what the writers supply to Dave. They supply him an act for those nights when, when he doesn't feel funny. And, and I have yet to see a night like that. Larry and I used to talk about this all the time at the beginning of the show, uh, w because originally they got picked up for four episodes. And he would say, I, I have just enough for the four shows that we're doing. But after that, they picked the show up. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have enough ideas. What am I supposed to do? And I said, uh, Larry, uh, it's 8 in the morning. I just woke up. Please. Um, but it's one of those things where the longer you do it, the more 
things occur to you? And of course, now, Larry David, having worried about that, okay, let me start that again. And now, Larry David, having worried about that at the beginning, he figured out a way throughout the years to incorporate his life into his work. And you know how you know how you're out at dinner with friends and somebody says something or something happens and somebody at, at the dinner table says, uh, this is just like an episode of Seinfeld. Uh, okay, that may or may not be true, but when you're with Larry David, you never know when uh, you know a scene from Curb Your Enthusiasm is gonna burst out. Uh, and I'll just give you an example. A couple of years ago, uh, Larry and I were having um, dinner and uh, we got to the end of the meal and I said to him, uh, how about some dessert? And he said to me, no, no dessert for me. Ted Denson and I have a bet. No dessert for a year. And I thought, whew, it's Larry David. It's Ted Danson. They're both billionaires. The bet is no dessert for a year. I mean, the bet has got to be at least $50,000, maybe $100,000. Maybe it's a million dollars. I said to him, how much is the bet for? He says, $200. I said, have a piece of friggin' cake. Let me just say this about Larry David. Uh, try as he might to distance himself from the character that the world sees, he will be unsuccessful at that because I, I know this guy. You know, there's a great expression, um, uh, alcoholics, are just like everybody else, except more so. And uh, Larry David is just like the guy you see in Curb Your Enthusiasm, except more so. He has, um, again, and I wish this was my line, but somebody once said about uh, famous people, um, when they get famous, they don't get better. And Larry, David, is the exception to that because Larry, as he has gotten better known, is much more comfortable in his skin than he used to be and much more self-aware. And I'll give you an example. We were at a Yankee game uh, last year and a, a kid comes up, you know, 18, 19 years old, comes up with a pen and paper and he says, uh, you know, uh, Mr. David, uh, can, can I get your autograph? And, he, and, and Larry says to him, uh, look, come back after the, the inning because this is no good. It's in the middle of the game. And the, the kid says, well, I can. He says, look, come back in the, in, in the, you know, after the inning because I'm watching the game. And, and the kid says, uh, but, but you don't understand. And Larry says, no, no, you don't understand. And then hearing himself do that, he burst out laughing and signed the kid's paper. So, like I have to tell you, 15 years ago, that does not happen. That does not, 15 years ago, uh, this whole scenario winds up in small claims court. I've been at the Letterman Show since 1991, and that's 18 years. And I would say during that time, the comedic sensibility of the show has changed, I want to say, half a dozen times. Because Dave has gotten older but the average age of the average writer has stayed the same. So they bring in their sensibilities and what they think is funny, and they try and interject it into the show. And so the show's comedic sensibility uh, changes, and it's, it's all valid, and we don't write anything and think, oh, I need to write this joke to appeal to the crucial male 18 to 34 demographic. We don't think like that. I, at least I don't. I just think, what's the funniest take that, that I can do? And sometimes uh, I, I think that things have passed me by just because I'm older and the people watching uh, are, are younger. Sometimes I think that. But funny is funny is funny. And uh, if you show somebody a Marx Brothers movie who's never seen one, I think that they'll think it's funny. And I don't think that they're going to ask, why isn't Groucho naked? You know, I want to see Groucho's deal. Late night has really changed in the last, um, 
I think in the last uh, three decades, let's say. I think that, uh, first of all, there's, there's more variety and there's more competition. You know, before 1982, there was Johnny and uh, Johnny Carson and people that he knocked off. So all of Late Night was just, was Carson. And it was a monologue. It was some sort of body, broad comedy aimed at people over 30, clearly. Um, and uh, white people over, and white men over, over 30. And um, so that was it. And then uh, Dave came along in 1982. And NBC gave Dave Letterman one directive. Uh, whatever you do, we want it not to be The Tonight Show. So we want a three-joke monologue, not a 25-joke monologue. Uh, we want, you know, we just don't want it to look like The Tonight Show. So given that go-ahead, it was very uh, free-flowing. It was irony-based. Uh, and it was, uh, the old producer Bob Morton used to say, uh, Late Night with David Letterman, it celebrated failure. It was not slick. It was very uh, anarchistic. And... Um, so that was, so, so then that comes along. Then uh, you have Dave moving to CBS, 1130, and you have this situation with Jay where uh, you had uh, one show uh, that was uh, host-driven, which is Dave, and, and uh, material-driven, um, more, I would say more concept-driven. And then he had another show, which is Jay, who was just essentially just a comic who got his own show, and it's monologue and guests and a little more uh, uh, traditional. And then you had the 1230 shows with Conan, and all of a sudden they were, David started this with going after younger audiences. I mean, people always say I started watching Dave in college, and uh, so there was a real market out there. And then, like I mentioned before, late night became this very lucrative um, uh, industry for the networks. Very cheap to produce. Very, and of course, uh, once uh, commercialism, once people start making money, it's going to tend to get watered down, and it's not going to be as uh, it's not going to be as fearless. Um, because there's a lot of people that depend, their livelihoods depend on your success. So it's not just kids screwing around anymore. And then what happened in, I would say, the late 90s uh, is that the other, the, the cable emerged as a late night force with The Daily Show and Colbert, and it was much more topical. Not that The Letterman Show, we, we always took care of what was in the news, and so did Jay, but it, it became uh, more of uh, the, the topical stuff. It became more topical and more issue-oriented. And, and I think we've certainly gone in that direction at The Late Show. And so that's the evolution of that. Now, I think that if I was to predict, and, and believe me, I'm always wrong, so put your money elsewhere. I think we're going to reach a critical mass with the, the topicality thing and people getting their news because I think it's going to get a little too partisan and I, I think that uh, late night shows are going to be put in uh, a situation uh, that they shouldn't be put in, uh, you know, unbeknownst to them. And I think it's probably going to go back to a little sillier and um, uh, a little uh, less uh, celebrity driven and, um, and, and kind of easier to take and less faux serious. You look at a guy like Craig Ferguson and watch what he's doing. He, nobody is doing what he's doing. And, and I think, he'll, I think he'll, he will emerge because he is silly. It's all him. 
you know, uh, you know, the guests don't really have to say anything. He's going to take care of it. And I think that um, I think that that's where we're going. I don't think that uh, Johnny uh, ever dreamed that he would influence uh, an election. Um, you know, he uh, he never talked about Watergate when Watergate was going on. He talked about it after the fact. Uh, but, uh, you know, Tina Fey had as much to do with the last election as, uh, as Dave did with the situation with McCain, as The Daily Show uh, does. So, uh, you know, look where that is. I mean, that's where we are, where these shows, and, 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 and none of these shows set out to influence elections, but that's what happens. They're, they're right in the, the popular culture. And, you know, I never bought all those uh, um, studies and surveys about people getting their news from late night television, I, and I still don't. But I think that people uh, turn to late night television um, to see what the point of view is on the news. I think they know going in. I don't think we're in the education business. Here's the deal with society. People fall in love with the idea of things rather than the reality of things. And that holds true for late night. You know, it's, it's so much uh, more provocative and sexier to say that people are watching our show and getting their news from Dave Letterman. And let me tell you, as somebody that writes monologue jokes and somebody that knows Dave, I, I, I'm telling you, we, we find that very funny. Here's the difference between uh, writing uh, monologue jokes and uh, writing uh, fiction. Uh, well, first of all, you use the word intern much less and waterboarding much less when you write fiction. No, the, it, it's, it's just, it's a different muscle. Uh, writing uh, monologue jokes or writing jokes for a nightly show is a volume business. It's a volume business. You're just turning out uh, quantity and then panning uh, for, for gold. So it's, you're using, uh, in, in the words of uh, the steroid universe, you're using your quick twitch muscles. You know, you're just firing more, uh, you're firing quicker and you're just reacting quicker. And it's all about takes, different, how many different takes to a premise. So that's, that's writing comedy for television. Now, writing uh, fiction, writing humorous fiction, everything slows down, and it's a different muscle, and it's a state of mind. And, uh, you know, I, I think writing jokes is, is a real physical practice, and, um, and it's all free association. And, and uh, writing fiction, again, it's inhabiting, uh, it's getting into a state of mind where you're, uh, for me, where you're inhabiting this world of these characters you created. And for me, writing fiction, you know, I want to be funny. I want my premises to be funny. I want my situations to be funny. I want my characters to be complicated. But it must be plausible. It must be plausible. Even, however chaotic, it must be plausible. And the thing about a lot of great monologue jokes is that they're not plausible. There's sort of a little, really, you know, it's like when <laughs> we talk about this, people ask me, how'd you learn to write fiction? Well, I learned to write fiction writing for Dave because, uh, you know, all of a sudden, uh, you know, we'd have some jokes about uh, Hillary Clinton and Dave would say, let's just start it with, hey, have you heard Hillary Clinton's going to jail? Well, She's not, she never was, but he loved that. It was a grabber, he could get a laugh, and then he, would, he could come down off it, off the joke. Now, um, that might find its way in somebody else's novel, but it's never gonna find its way in uh, my novel. I'll give you an example. Uh, we <laughs> when Hillary was elected to the Senate, um, and then Bill was out of office, there was a story in the Times that he was a little lonely in Chappaqua. He was sort of rattling around the house. 
So he would go down once a week and have breakfast <laughs> at a coffee shop in Chappaqua. And that's kind of quaint. It's kind of charming. Well, that, that wasn't good enough for us. That was, that we, we didn't like that. That wasn't good comedically. So we did jokes for two weeks about him hanging out at a singles bar in Chappaqua. We just made up all these, and it was great, and we had a ball with it, and, and is it, well, I guess I'm sort of arguing against myself because it is a little plausible that Clinton might go to a, a singles bar, but we just made it up, and, um, and people knew we had made it up, and it was, it was very valid as, as, uh, as comedy. So that's the deal. The best advice I ever got about writing fiction was um, write what you know and make your characters' lives complicated. Because, you know, we all have a story in us, and it's, it's our autobiography, and I know we think it's fascinating. God knows I do. And it may very well be fascinating, but it ain't complicated. Th this is my third novel, Everything Hurts. And, and it, is, um, it is born of uh, real life. It, this is a book about a guy trying to get rid of a psychosomatic limp. And he uh, uh, seeks the aid uh, of a legitimate self-help guru. He's an accidental self-help guru. And to cure him of his psychosomatic limp, he seeks the aid of a legitimate self-help guru. And this is born of real life because for three and a half years, I, I dragged a foot, I limped, I was in constant pain, and it was, uh, it confounded doctors. X-rays and MRIs turned up nothing, the pain moved around, there was no consistent symptomatology, it came and went of its own accord, it made no sense to anybody, but I was in constant pain, and so I sought the help of a guy who specialized in uh, psychosomatic pain. And uh, he believes uh, that uh, the pain is caused by unconscious rage driving to your conscious mind. And your conscious mind is so threatened by the, the coming rage that it tries to distract you by giving you pain to a vulnerable area. That's his theory. I still believe in it. I really do. And so his uh, approach is to examine your past. So I had been seeing him for a little while, and I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write a novel about a guy trying to get rid of a psychosomatic limp and try to art myself out of this pain. And I started writing it. It took me two years to finish. Two years later, I'm finished with the book. Son of a bitch, guy in the book is fine. I'm still dragging a foot and in constant pain. So I sold the book to Simon & Schuster. Ten days after I sold the book, I went to yet another doctor, took another look at another x-ray and said to me, you need a hip replacement. I'm not telling you you should get one. I'm telling you you have to get one. This is a no-brainer. And so a year ago in July, last July, I got my hip replaced. I'm out of pain. I feel great. And everybody who, you know, suffered along with me said, you must be furious, three and a half years, limping in constant pain. And I say the same thing to all of them. If I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have gotten the book out of it. So, you know, the journey is the destination, right? You have no idea um, because, as I, as I mentioned, I was in constant pain. And one of the few times that I was not in pain was when I was writing. And I mean writing at the Letterman show or working on the fiction. But at the end of the day, here the day would be over. I'd come home and relax, put my feet up. Incredible pain. And they could not be relieved by any pill or anything like that, which made me sure it was. Uh, and so this book is, is a reflection uh, of that. And uh, I think that, um, you know, and I'm sure people have said this before, but uh, artists create because they have to, not because they need to, um, and not because uh, they think they should, but because they have to. And this, is, this was a classic case of it. So it was very fulfilling. It was very ambitious because I was suffering while I was writing it. And the guy is getting better. And it's like, and I was aspiring to the character I was writing about, which is, 
uh, boy, I, I'd love to recreate that in my next book. Wouldn't that be great?